Okay, so this is week six, so we're going to talk pediatrics. Pediatrics is all about growth and development. So we grow in a cephalocaudal manner from the time we are newborns, where we head downward. And then proximodistal, which is midline to the periphery, so the trunk, and then out to the extremities. And we also develop motor skills. Gross motor always develops before fine motor. With our pediatric patients, especially the infants, we expect them to achieve what we call milestones. So for instance, on your screen there, when the infant is three months old, we would anticipate that they can hold their head up and their chest off the ground. That by the time they're six to seven months old, they should be able to roll over. Eight to nine months old, they're crawling. By the time between nine and 15 months old, they're able to pull themselves up they can cruise around furniture by the time they're 10 months old. And for most kids, by the time they're 12 months old, they are able to walk on their own. They're taking their first steps. But the thing to remember is that kids develop at their own pace. So that's why there's a range. We don't want to tell the parents, oh, well, your child is nine months old and they're not pulling themselves up and, and cruising around furniture because that's going to cause them alarm. So as long as we would educate them that all kids develop at their own pace, that's what's most important. The reason why we're looking at these things is we want to make sure, first of all, that they're developing appropriately, that their neuro status is intact, and that they are, you know, they do have these different skills that we anticipate that they will have. If by chance the kiddo is 15 months old, 18 months old, and they're still not walking on their own, that might be cause for concern. Fine motor skills then start to develop around 6 to 12 months. An example of a fine motor skill would be pincer grasp. So if the kiddo is able to pick up something and hold it in their hand, or passing objects from hand to hand, those would be examples of fine motor skills. Your textbook goes through a lot of the theorists. I am only going to focus on Erickson. That's the one that I feel is most uh, relevant as far as nursing is concerned because you learn Erickson even when you are working with your adult population. So for the purposes of our pediatric study, we are going to focus on Erickson. So Infancy, which is trust versus mistrust, and the way this uh, works is if the infant cries and needs help and somebody comes and does what they need to do to help the infant change their diaper, feed them, then the infant develops trust. They know that when they cry, someone's going to come and help them. On the other hand, if they cry and nobody comes, then they develop mistrust, and this can have impact and cause anxiety for that infant. With early childhood, we're talking toddlers, autonomy versus shame and doubt. So when we're toddlers, we start to learn, we do potty training, right? As parents, we teach our toddlers how to potty train. So that is developing a certain level of independence. Now we are controlling when we go to the bathroom. So that does uh, give them some form of autonomy. So if we are positive in our reinforcements when they go to the bathroom and we, you know, we give them positive reinforcement, that's good. Then they are going to feel good about what they did. But on the other hand, if they have accidents and we will chastise them or scold them because they've had accidents, that's going to create shame and doubt. For our preschool population, it's initiative versus guilt. So they start to learn how to build things. Using blocks, they build things. Uh, they play with toys uh, like dolls. Uh, they play with cars and trucks. So they have a lot of initiative. They're very, very curious. They want to learn things. But if we, again, if we don't show positive reinforcement for what they are learning and encourage them to learn, they could develop guilt. If we, on the other hand, scold them for learning things or for experimenting or looking around, seeking new things, you know, we want to keep them safe. So we educate them about ways to keep them safe. But we don't want to discourage that initiative because then they develop guilt. With our school-age child, this is industry versus inferiority. 
So they definitely are starting to uh, develop their rational thinking. They're more cognitive. They have more understanding about how their body works, how the universe works. You know, they do develop a sense of right and wrong. They understand what boundaries they have. They're, they're very uh, well versed in that. So, but they are also very curious and they like to learn and we want to encourage them to learn. But on the other hand, if we are judgmental of them, if we put too high standards on them or we try to have them be too perfect, that can cause inferiority. And then finally, in your adolescent population, this group here is trying to figure out who they are. They're trying to learn who they are and how they fit in the world. So they're trying to figure out their own identity. But if they don't have some strong uh, parental figures, someone that they can rely on for support and to help them to learn, they can uh, end up in role confusion. That's very, very common. So those are the only parts uh, as far as the theorists that I'm going to be covering. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, we're going to spend some time talking about hospitalization of the child. So this could be a new experience for the child and the family. Everybody has a first time of being in the hospital. It's a very unfamiliar environment. They're being cared for by strangers. They don't know their caregivers, right? They're being put in a strange place that they don't know that they've never been before. And children are one of our vulnerable populations. They don't have the same type of coping skills that adults do. So they may not deal with being in the hospital very well. It's very scary for them. So our role as the nurse is to make sure that we are aware of that, that we are providing them with a safe place, which is would be their room, and that we are educating the family and the and the kid about what's going to be happening. We're always providing anticipatory guidance. It's crucial when you're dealing with the pediatric population because remember this is very strange for them. This is not something that they probably ever experienced before. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to go through the different developmental levels. So for your infant, this can cause a certain amount of stress for them because they are they understand that they are in a strange place with strange people. They're not verbal. They can't express those things to us verbally. They express it through their behavior. It may make them more irritable, more crabby. They may have some sleep deprivation even. And they do have a certain level of stranger anxiety between 6 and 18 months of old of age. Then the toddler they have limited verbal skills. You know, they know their name. They may know how old they are. They know their mom. They know their dad. But, you know, they, they really aren't able to express their fears because they don't really understand what's happening. They have a very poor developed sense of body image and of boundaries. They have limited understanding of what the hospitalization is and the treatments that they are going to be given. They, they don't really have much of ability to follow directions. So when you're trying to educate, you do definitely need to keep that in mind because now you're gonna be educating more for the parents than you are for the child. You're gonna explain what you're doing, but you need to have it in an age appropriate way that they can understand, okay? You have to remember that they have very limited ability to understand. They will experience separation anxiety. So trying to keep the parents, at least one parent there or a family member, somebody there that they feel comfortable with, that they feel safe with if the parents are not able to be there. And they may have some regression. You may notice that some of their behaviors, they act more like babies. You know, they, they cry more, they need to be cuddled more. You know, you might see that, and that definitely would be something that you'd want to educate the parents about, that that might be something that they might see. With the preschool child, they also have some limitations to their verbalizations, but they can talk more than your toddler can. They, they kind of know what it means to be sick. They may have been sick in the past, so they understand when they don't feel good. But they have very magical thinking. So they might end up thinking that they are being punished in some way for something that they did 
they were naughty in some way. And so now they're being punished and that's why they're in the hospital and that's why they're sick. So that's definitely something to keep in, in mind. Definite uh, separation anxiety. So if for some reason your, your parents, both of them, one or the other of them cannot be with the child, again, asking if there is someone that they feel safe with that could stay in the hospital with them. They may have possible fear of bodily harm. They're afraid of painful procedures. And they also might uh, regress to a certain extent because, um, you know, by now with preschoolers, we anticipate that they're going to be potty trained. So educating the parents that don't be surprised if you notice that your kiddo might wet the bed at night. This is just a, a form of anxiety, really. It's just related to the hospitalization. And once they go home and they get over being sick, they should get back to their normal habits again. For your school age child, they understand about, they're starting to understand about body function. They can describe pain for you. You can actually use the number scale when you're talking about pain with a school age child. They understand cause and effect. They understand that, you know, they have this bug, that this something that's causing them to be sick and now they're sick. Uh, they may fear some of that loss of control. Again, it's a strange environment around strange people. They might uh, seek some way of maintaining control. So with a school-aged child, it's a great idea to get them involved in the plan of care as much as possible, to give them some measure of control. Let them make what decisions that they can and what they're able to do and what is safe because that's going to help them kind of feel a little bit of empowerment so that they don't feel so helpless. They may sense when they're not being told the truth. So you have to be very careful. Your school-aged child are fantastic lie detectors. They know when someone's not being honest with them. So we have to be very careful as their caregiver that we're always being honest. We don't ever want to hedge when we're trying, when they ask us a question, we want to make sure that we answer them as honestly as possible. Of course, making our responses age appropriate. When we're dealing with the pediatric patient, it's always age appropriate. And they may have stress related to being away from their peers because they are developing those friendships now. They probably have a couple of kids that they consider their what we call BFFs, right? They have a lot of those uh, relationships with their peers, usually same-sex relationships where they get very, very close in friendship and uh, they consider themselves to be best friends. So they may feel some anxiety of being separated from them and also from their routine. Kids like their routines and when those get disrupted, it causes a lot of stress and anxiety for them. For your adolescent, they do understand cause and effect. They do understand how the body works. They, uh, they are probably going to fear body image problems you know, depending on the reason that they're in the hospital, they may fear some sort of disfigurement from whatever the problem is. They may uh, have a perception of severity based on body image change. So if you see that picture there, that girl's got her head shaved, maybe, you know, you could interpret that maybe she's a cancer patient who is undergoing chemotherapy. And, you know, she's shaving her head in anticipation of losing her hair. So, you know, that's a, that's a blow for an adolescent, especially for a girl. They would be embarrassed about losing control. Remember, as the adolescent, they are seeking control. They're trying to figure out who they are. They're trying to develop a certain measure of independence. The peer group is everything to them. Their world revolves around their peers. And when they have to be in the hospital, now they're being separated from those peers. And that can be very anxiety producing for them. They feel unplugged or isolated. School equals social life, right? That's how they socialize, by being in school. And there may be a certain measure of peer pressure, depending, you know, uh, they, what's going on? Why are you in there? How long are you going to be in there? When are you going to be done? You know, we have X, Y, and Z that we have to do. And, you know, they may feel some measure of pressure from their friends because of this hospitalization. So that's all 
something that the nurse that's caring for this age of child would need to be aware of and need to be communicating to the family as well. Something that you could do and incorporate in your plan of care as the nurse for either the school age or the adolescent, you could try to see if you could uh, figure out how to get friends to come and visit. If, if it's appropriate, as long as the kid's not on isolation and there's no contraindications, maybe you could have one or two of their closest friends come and visit them, and that would go a long way to making them feel better. Okay, so a little bit about separation anxiety. There's three stages to it. The first stage is the protest stage. So this is where the child's realizing that the parents might be leaving, they may cry, they may act very aggressively, they may get very temperamental and act out. Then the next phase is the despair phase where they might seem like they're a little bit withdrawn, they may not communicate very much, and that's where you might see that behavior regression. If you think about your preschool child, you know, they may end up wetting the bed where they normally, when they're at home, they don't do that. And then there's the detachment phase where they repress pain at the sense of loss and they are kind of disinterested when their parents come back. They really don't show much excitement that the parents have come back. Now, you can imagine as the parents, this is going to cause them to have a lot of uh, guilt for having to leave the child. So again, if there's any way that someone the child feels comfortable with could come and stay while the parents have to go to work or whatever the situation may be, that might be the best idea to help with this type of anxiety. Some things that we could recommend as part of the plan of care to try to help to decrease some of this stress of hospitalization, rooming in, having the parents stay with the child, having at least one parent to stay with the child. Now this can be difficult if you have a two income household where both parents have to work. So trying to find out what the social support system is when you do your family assessment, finding out if there is anybody else that could potentially come and stay with the child. Encouraging the child to bring something from home that may help them feel comfortable, a favorite toy or blanket. Have them draw a picture that you can hang up on their whiteboard or hang up on the wall somewhere in their room. Maybe watch a movie with them or have them select a game. Any type of activity that you're doing with the children, you got to make sure that it's age appropriate. So it may not be age appropriate to have a toddler try to watch a movie, but it would be okay for you to sit down with them and, and maybe draw some pictures, have them color a little bit, maybe build some blocks with the big blocks, you know, those would all be appropriate. If it's a preschool child, it may or may not be appropriate to have them watch a TV program. They have a short attention span, so they may not be able to sit for a full-length movie, but you might be able to get them to watch a short cartoon if that helps them. When we're talking therapeutic play, and we're going to talk more about this as we go along, but play serves a very important role when we're talking about child development. And therapeutic play most especially is very important with these types of situations to help to decrease the anxiety that the child may be feeling. And a child life specialist is key to help with that. If your facility is lucky enough to have child life specialists, definitely get them involved because they're going to go a long way to helping to reduce all these stressors. Guided imagery, you know, for an older child, uh, school age or adolescent and role modeling you know really having talking to them especially your older child having them express their fear and anxiety tell them to talk to you make you know you got to establish that therapeutic relationship so that they trust you and they will want to talk to you and and tell you what's going on if you uh, so play serves a very important purpose as i said before so some of the things that play does it allows children to express fears and feelings it facilitates problem solving for children they learn how to problem solve through their play they learn how to socialize with one another through their play they practice socially acceptable behaviors they start to learn right from wrong it can be instructional in some cases you know, it can be obviously developmentally, it needs to be developmentally appropriate, um, and it can be stress relieving. It kind of 
if, if you give them a doll and you say, okay, can you just show me how you're feeling right now? You know, use your doll to show me how you're feeling. If they're banging away on that doll or they're grabbing them and they're kind of squeezing them or, or, you know, obviously that is showing you some frustration, maybe some anger, maybe some fear. So that can spark the conversation for you. If you're dealing with a, especially if you're dealing with an older child, a school age child or an adolescent child, it's much easier to get them to open up about their feelings than it is for the smaller child because the smaller child may not understand. With the smaller child, you may just be observing as they're playing and seeing what you see because you should be able to pick up on any of those stressors and anxiety while you're observing them. Okay, some nursing considerations to keep in mind. You, like I said earlier, you want to try to involve the child in decisions, whatever is appropriate. You want to provide for their safety, so you're going to be educating them and their family about certain hazards that may be in the hospital if they have an IV, if they have an IV pole, you know, being aware that as far as uh, getting in and out of the bed that they have help for that. If there's any isolation precautions, if the child is on isolation for any reason, well then the child can't leave the room. They must stay in the room and educating them about how people are going to look when they come into the room with gowns and you know masks and gloves, whatever the isolation may be. Have the parents bring a toy from home, maybe a favorite toy for the child so that they have that. Uh, demonstrate procedures on a doll or stuffed animal. So uh, for a preschool child most especially, you can use inanimate objects to kind of describe what it is that you're going to be doing. And that's going to give them a measure of calm because you're showing them that this taking their blood pressure doesn't hurt. Listening to their heart doesn't hurt. You know, you can show them the stethoscope. You can let them put the stethoscope in their own ears and listen to their own heart and their own lungs. Whatever it takes to decrease and diffuse that situation and show them that it's everything that we do is not going to be painful for them. That's going to re relieve a lot of that anxiety and that's going to help them trust us as well. Most uh, pediatric units do have a playroom. So again, if the child is not on isolation, there should be no reason why they cannot go to the toy room. So that's one thing that you would probably want to do immediately after you get the child settled, provided that, it, that it's a stable situation and there's no reason that they couldn't go for a few minutes down to the toy room. But giving them a tour of the unit, talking to the family about where things are at, where the family kitchen is, where the toy room is, you know, the kids can bring stuff to their room. That would be very important at the beginning when you're first admitting, as long as they're stable. And then again, encouraging the friends to visit, especially for your older child, your school-age child and your adolescent, because they're going to be feeling isolated from their friends. And we know that their friends are such an important part of their lives, especially the adolescent child. You know, that's their social circle. That's, that's, the key. So we have to make sure that we are not separating them. We, we want to try to encourage their friends to come and that's going to help them to feel better. Okay, so one very important concept with pediatrics is pain assessments. There are various tools that we may use to assess pain. What is important for everyone who works in pediatrics to understand is that pain exists even in utero, even before babies are born, they can feel pain. So children feel pain and they feel the same type of pain. Whatever causes a pain in an adult causes pain in a child. And there's lots of research out there that actually children feel more pain than adults do. They have a heightened sense of pain compared to adults. So here on the screen are some examples of the different uh, tools that we use to assess pain. For neonates, the NPAS, uh, they, they use that. For FLAC, that's the infants two months to seven years is the FLAC. So that's face, legs, arms, uh, cry, and consolability. That's what that means. For your preschool and to school age faces, 
So that's the Wong Baker scale that you see on your screen there. Uh, you can also use this for your older child. You can use this for adults even. You know, th there's no uh, set age that you use this for. Sometimes with adults, I have found that they don't really understand what I mean when I say, you know, give me a rating of your pain, 0 to 10. Sometimes they don't understand what that means. But if you show them the faces scale, then they get it. Oh, 10, I'm crying. Okay, I get it. That means my pain is really bad. The Oucher scale is specific to your preschool age. Uh, not so much the school age, but you can use it for school age. Numeric scale, the uh, example here is for 12 years and older, but you can actually use it for your second or third graders because they understand what, what numbers are. They, they can usually count from uh, one to 10 by the time they're in third, you know, second, third, fourth grade. So they should be able to uh, use the number scale without too much trouble. The CHEOPS is uh, a scale that is specific to like nonverbal children. That's more uh, behavior oriented, observing different behaviors. Okay, so atraumatic measures. I wanted to touch on this because it's very important. Again, when we are dealing with the pediatric population, we are strangers to them, and they are going to be fearful of us. We teach our children to be afraid of strangers, and we are strangers. So we have to incorporate some atraumatic measures in our care to try to decrease some of this anxiety that they are going to be feeling. So one of the ways that we do that is by using treatment rooms. So any painful procedure that takes place should be done in a treatment room, should be done in a separate room. So it says to avoid safe places. Well, safe places would definitely be the child's room. The playroom would be considered a safe place. The kitchen, you know, where they go and maybe they grab a snack or mom gets them a drink of water or whatever, that would be considered safe. So Really and truly, the best place to do any type of procedures would be the treatment room. Offer choices where you can. As long as it's safe, not contraindicated, let them make a, a choice or two. You know, you, things have to be done, and you try to uh, be as reasonable as possible. And by offering them some choices, that's going to help. That's going to help them be more cooperative. Definitely allow the parent to stay. Keep the parent involved. This is family-centered care. So the parents definitely need to be involved at every step. And incorporate play therapy. Remember, play allows the child to express their feelings and anxiety. And sometimes if they're having pain, they if you try to play with them a little bit, that not only provides a method of distraction, but it also helps them to get those feelings out of how they really feel. And it's very important that we incorporate these measures into their plan of care. It's essential. Another atraumatic measure that I just wanted to touch on, if you do have to do procedures and you're taking the child to the treatment room, make sure that the parents, at least one of them, is with you. Don't take the kid away to do your treatment and leave the parents in the room. Make sure that, first of all, the parents can handle what it is you have to do. You know, an IV can be a very traumatic experience. They, the kid has to get held down, and there may be some blood involved, and it's painful. So you have to explain all that to the parents, explain all that to the kiddo. But don't leave them. Make sure that they come with, because they're the kid's safety net. And if you're taking them away from the parents, that's going to cause a lot of anxiety for them. So definitely keeping the parents involved in that way. Another important part of our role as the nurse is assisting the parents with the hospitalization of the child. Keep them involved. Allow them to tell the story. They're the experts. That's important to remember when you're dealing in pediatrics. The parent is the expert on the child. They know their child better than anybody does, and that's who you need to get the information from. Make sure that they participate in the care. Let them know, you know, let's make a plan of what we're going to be doing for your kiddo. These are the prescriptions that we receive from the doctor. So let's get together. Let's put our heads together and come up with a plan.
and make sure that they're involved in it. Assess home routines, preferences, developmental and any special needs that the child may have. Because again, the child likes their routine, so we want to try to maintain the routine as much as we can. Make sure that they go to bed at the same time they go to bed at home. Let's promote trust. Let's establish that therapeutic relationship with the parent and with the child. Prompt attention to the child's needs. That's going to help them. That's going to help them a lot. Making sure that they have confidence that we're taking the very best care of their child that we can. And definitely giving positive reinforcement. Remember, they might feel a certain measure of guilt because their kiddo's in the hospital. And maybe they didn't recognize how serious things were. They didn't realize how sick their kid really was. And now their kid's in the hospital. So these are all things that we have to make sure we take into consideration when we're taking care of them. Because you're not just taking care of the child. You're taking care of the whole family. The whole family is your patient. Okay, that's all I have for this recording. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.